I think in this industry specifically, like the compound, the compounding effect of doing a little work every day is bigger than I've seen it anywhere else in any, like any other space that I've worked in. And you see this a lot with some of the people who are at the high end of the market. I mean, I think the first time I heard somebody point this out, they were talking about Seth Godin or Malcolm Gladwell or something like that. But they said, you know, these guys, they, they put in a lot of effort to become known as the person in their field. But once you get there, it's actually pretty easy to maintain because mm-hmm. all information tends to flow to you. Like people send you case studies that are related to the things that you write about. And it's like a lot of the information kind of comes in, but you need to maintain that momentum and you can maintain it in a very short period of time, but let it go for too long. And it, like, you got to like recrank that engine. So all that to say, I think you and I work pretty similarly, which is that Definitely. a little work in the morning goes a long way as long as you don't break that chain too often this is gonna be uh, this is such a good topic to start the year off and, and let's just dive right into it so yes th- we, we wanted to start with this today because this is a a great way to start the year right every single year at the beginning of the year more and more people are are realizing that they have to get involved with this space just the way our society is moving we all have these hybrid lives, right? We have our real life, which is like the, the things we do, the places we go, and we have our online life. And that's why like this ties into the metaverse and eventually we'll talk about Web3 stuff, but the metaverse is already here. You know, there's no real such thing as like, I'm going to the metaverse now. The metaverse is like the life and the reality that we have on the internet. And so we all are being forced more or less to create a reality for ourselves online. And I am predicting, I've already seen with the huge influx of, of academy members we've had, that people are, are taking this seriously and they're thinking, okay, I got to start. If I'm starting from scratch today, which model would I use to build my personal enterprise? And so th- this is the topic. This is how we're going to start off the new year. Uh, and we have a couple options here. We're going to go through these one by one. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about the option of a paid newsletter. So paid, everything that we're going to talk about has pros and cons. There's reasons why you should do it. And there's reasons why maybe you shouldn't do it. I think a paid newsletter is, is great. It's, it's um, simple and it's streamlined and it's very direct. I think the problem one of the downsides with the paid newsletter is what you and I experience all the time is that once you make that commitment, you are on the hook for feeding the beast. <laughs> you know, and the, the beast is hungry and the beast never sleeps. And so you have to have like some, some real stamina. So I, I have a, a couple of really good examples of paid newsletters, but I, I want to refer to you a little bit with this because you just have so much experience in the newsletter space. So in, in your view, like what are the pros and cons of of a paid newsletter to build your personal enterprise? Uh, So that's a great question. Before I get into it, I think what I'd love to do is just set a little bit more of the groundwork for people who are listening to this. So you posed a great question, which is, hey, if you're starting from scratch, uh, how best, what's the best approach to building a personal enterprise? And the reason that we're starting here, as you mentioned, is because this is something that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, the extra color that I'd love to add here, and I want to get your take on this, is uh, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, different people are going to have different goals. And there are a ton of different approaches to this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before we go too much further, could we color in some of the lines for like, who is going to benefit the most from this conversation? What uh, specifically, like, if I'm listening to this and I'm going to get a lot out of this podcast, in your opinion, who am I? Like, how much money am I looking to make? Uh, how quickly? Just tell me a little bit about, or let's let's just let's set the guardrails for what the conversation is, because sure. I think you can build a multi-million dollar media company, or, or you could build like a hundred thousand dollar media company, and the approaches might be a little different. So, from your take, what does that look like? In my take, it's probably. We want to define it, but I think people of all age brackets are starting to, to come here, whether you're Gen Zs probably or Gen Xers, probably not so much boomers, although some of them, 
definitely millennials and definitely the Zoomers, the Gen Zs. Uh, I think like for me, the good benchmark on a measure for success, at least the first step is like, how do I get to $10,000 a month in revenue? That's, that's a spot where like, you can probably hire an assistant. You're got enough money that you can live off of. You can put some money in the bank account and you have a little bit of money to like reinvest into your business. So I think, I think who we're we talking to, we're talking to a Joe or a Sally who's driving home from the gym, thinking to themselves, how can I get total freedom and utility over my time? How do I start an online brand and put content out there and monetize it, right? And so Joe or Sally is driving home thinking, how do I get to the point where I can do $10,000 a month in revenue? And you know, once we get there, we can get to that next stage. But I think that's the goal for Joe and Sally. Got it. Okay, I love that. I think this is a great uh, lead into the conversation. So I have, I have, I was thinking a lot about this and I'd love to lay out a framework that Joe or Sally can use to think through this. If you will, if you'll allow me, um, because I think the approach, the specific tools that you use to build this empire can change. I mean, you mentioned zoomers, there's a lot of people, I mean, they're more in touch with something like TikTok than I am. Uh, there's a lot too. of people who are, who are making TikTok work, um, or whether it's you know paid newsletters or Twitter or private discords or anything. There's a lot of different options on the table. But if you understand the uh, the the true underlying model, it is universal. I think, and, and this is what I think it looks like. I'm going to give a high level, and then we can dive into the individual things that, that you were talking about. So high level, if you are sitting in your car thinking, I want to get into this and I want to make money. This is what I think it looks like. First, cash flow first, yes. right? Because, yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna get into this. This plays into uh, how you get started. High level, cash flow first. Then you build trust and influence. Then you build products. And um, to drill in very briefly on each of those, cash flow. This is like how you're gonna sustain yourself month to month while you build, right? Because uh, a lot of the upside from like a media company, whether it's a paid newsletter or something else, comes down the line. You need to convince people to trust you first. That takes time. So you can't do that out of the gates. So you need to make sure that you have some form of income, whether it's an existing job that's not in media or a new job or even a new company, like in the services realm, um, which I know, Tim, is, is something you're a fan of as well. So cash flow first, we'll dig into that. Then trust and influence. How do you grow awareness of you and your ideas and your abilities through mediums like newsletters, Twitter, podcast, et cetera? Um, those can be monetized. That trust and influence can be monetized via like ads or affiliate deals. And we can get into that. And then on the very back end of that, you have paid products, things like paid newsletters, um, paid communities. Uh, things that generate recurring revenue that grow the lifetime value of those uh, people who now know and trust you. So that I think is the underlying model. I wanted to start there because if you understand that, you can choose the tools that you use. You can choose your approach. I, I'll pause there for a second, but I want to kind of get your take on that high level model. And then if, if you agree with me on that, based on your experience, Maybe we can start with the uh, cash flow first options. Like what are cash flow first options for people getting into this? I love this way to think about it. I think it's common for people to say, what is, I think it's common for people to ask themselves this question, what am I going to do? And, and, and think of like the scheme, right? The scheme is like, do I have a newsletter? Do I sell ads? Do I have a membership site? Do I have products? Do I have courses? But the, the way to actually do it is to just think about what the, the intention is, because you can get the same intention through all of these different schemes. But if, if you start with like the scheme first, you might just be doing a lot of time and, and spending a lot of effort moving in a direction that isn't even where like you want to build your life around. So cash flow first is such a great principle that I think everybody needs to take more seriously because one of, one of the bad habits that I see people get into when they first start is they think to themselves, I'm just going to start making content. 
right? Like, I'm just going to put myself out there. I'm just going to start to build an audience. And although that's important because you need to establish that trust and influence, like you said, you're going to run out of money and time and resources are just like an important part of this. And I think people, uh, maybe it's like taboo. You know, I, I see it on Twitter, this trend recently where it's like more and more common for people to be super vulnerable about, you know, like their mental health or even body issues or something like that. But if you talk about money, it's still super, super taboo. And I think that that is detrimental. And I think it gets in the way to a lot of people's success because the first thing you need to do is think about money. Like the first thing you need to do is like, okay, how do I take this idea? And how do I get some cash? And until you figure that out, the scheme is a little bit irrelevant because you can, you can figure all that out later, but without resources, without cash flow, like you're going to starve, um, both like metaphorically and literally. Um, so yes, cash flow first. I love it. That's a fascinating way of putting it. And I, I, I hadn't thought about that before, but you're right. Uh, there are a lot of things that have kind of become de tabooified. I'm going to make that a word now. Um, but money is not one of them yet. So when it comes to cash flow first, if this is step one, and we both agree on this, um, I was thinking about it some more and I'm thinking to myself, well, what are the possible paths, right? Yeah. And I know there's, here's what I came up with. I came up with basically two. So if it, strict from a strictly cash flow perspective, you basically have two options. You can, you can start a business or you can get a job, right? Like those are both paths to cash flow. And uh, when it comes to the business, actually, I think both of them are probably more similar than they are different. But when it comes to starting a business, you are probably going to be in the services industry. And uh, Tim, I know this is something that you're a big fan of. So I'll probably let you take the lead on this. But the the reason wh uh, why, I th why I think it's going to be a services business is because um, services are very easy to turn into money quickly, right? Like, People need things done. If you're willing to do them, it's easy to get people to pay you. Um, and uh, that's, that, I guess that's just, I'll, that's important. I'm going to pause there and let you talk about this because this is, I think, something that you're a little bit closer to than me. But if you're looking for cash flow fast, you have two options job or service business. What's your take on that? Yeah. There's my, my take is absolutely the fastest path to building a sustainable revenue stream is services. And the it's not like sexy, I guess is the way to say it, because so much of this online entrepreneurship um, community loves this idea of leverage and scalability and like 10Xing or 100Xing your time. But what we forget is that reputation is like an actual marketing asset. I like to think of it that has measurable value. And the best way to build your reputation in the very beginning while also sustaining a business is by selling your time, is by doing services, is by doing really, really good work. And so freelancing is the place that I think everybody should start. Sure, there's disadvantages to it. You have to be patient. You know, like sometimes you got to deal with clients. It's not necessarily the most scalable thing, but what happens is that I call it reputation. You call it trust and influence. Uh, eventually the people you meet, the work you do, the things people say about you, both in person and online starts to bubble. And then as you build this brand around yourself, as you build this trust and influence and you have people saying good things about you, then what starts to happen? You know, then all of a sudden you got people signing up for your email list. You know, then all of a sudden you got people saying, uh, hey, I got this new idea. Maybe you could exchange your services for like a piece of the company as opposed to just getting paid on a, on a retainer. So in my view, um, this unscalable uh, model of services over time is actually the the runway, like the launch pad to get yourself into what other, other schemes you want to devise, whether that be like a paid newsletter or a membership site or a product or whatever, like to get there, you first need to build your reputation. And I think the best way to do that is through services. For sure. Yeah. Is this how copy started? 
Uh, more or less. Yeah. Coffee Blogger started because yeah, Brian was doing freelance writing, um, years and years ago. This is how Stasi started. Like I was just a freelance writer. Um, <laughs> same thing with Sober Nation. Like I was just writing for like everything that I've ever done started on a one-to-one -one level of me, like meeting people, getting clients, doing good work, building relationships, building reputation. And then those people like following me because they thought that I had something of value to say. And it's that audience that is the actual asset. And so people come into this thinking like, okay, I just need to get followers, right? Is that what to do? I'm going to start documenting my journey. I'm going to start taking selfies. Like I just need to get followers. But until you have that actual um, like credibility, you know, until you have, until people are saying things about you, that you aren't forcing until there's a conversation around you that like you aren't um, the, the driving force of. It's just very, very difficult to get there. For sure. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting to think about the specific examples. Uh, this is also how I started my career. So I actually started, I've wanted to be a writer for a long time, but I started my career doing web development, uh, freelance, because that was what I could get paid to do. Actually, when I think back on it, <laughs> My first, like one of my first freelance jobs actually was a writing gig through Craigslist. Nice. Um, yeah, but it was doing uh, paid reviews for dating websites. And I ended up quitting because I was like, if I just felt so morally uh, <laughs> like obligated. I was like, if somebody uses one of these and then just it's like gets attacked or something, it's going to be on me. So I dropped that job and ended up starting doing web design because it was the only thing people would pay me for freelance. And it was sure. a journey to get to the point where I was ultimately writing for a living, but started you know with that. I just realized it, technically speaking, the hustle started this way too, because it was an events company before it was yep. a newsletter, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, just over and over again, I, I see people, I mean, geez, Nathan um, from ConvertKit is a really good example of this. Like he was just a, a designer and a product developer until he solved his own problem eventually with the clients that he was working for by, by building a product. So I, I see over and over and over again, all the successful people I know started by just <laughs> getting dirty, you know, by getting yeah. their hands dirty, by doing the work. And it's that, um, it's that reputation that you build, which allows you to get to some of these other scalable models, which I think we could talk about. For sure. Before we move on to the next step, which you've alluded to a couple of times, which is that like trust and, re and reputation, the asset that you're building. Yeah. I want to spend a, a, another minute camped here on this cash flow first idea in order to highlight two things. So the first is that whether you get a job or start your own freelance agency, in my opinion, uh, there are lots of different approaches to this, but mostly what you're going to be doing is some form of marketing. And what I mean by that is like, if you look at what people pay freelancers for, it is content marketing or social media marketing or web development, which is also a form of marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a reason for this. It's because there is a very uh, clear transfer of value there. Uh, if I am trying to grow my business and I pay you to help me and my business grows, it's easy for me to justify like whatever I paid you. Sure. And so it's very easy to sell freelance services that are related to marketing somehow. And the reason I call this out is because I hope that it helps people think through their approach to this section. Because like it can be difficult to say, okay, well, I'm going to go into my business for myself. What am I going to start doing? There's a lot of options, but at the end of the day, you will probably see the, the quickest success if the options that you pay attention to are the ones that are centered around making more money for somebody else, yeah. um, because it's just really easy to get paid for those. The other thing I want to say, we've talked a little bit about freelancing so far, um, and I do think that that's a really viable way to get started. Uh, and if... if if people find it interesting, we can talk, maybe it'd be fun to do an episode where we both just talk about specifically how we got our first clients, because I think that's cool. there's, 
Yeah, that could be like a really fun thing to talk Funny about. Just get, yeah, su- and get like super nitty gritty, talk about some of the tactics and stuff. Let us know like on Twitter or whatever, if you want us to talk about that. Um, Cause there are some very concrete ways to do that. But the, I, I don't want to short shrift the, the other concept of uh, having and just keeping a job. Because I do think that it's at the end of the day, it's, it's cash flow that allows you to pursue this larger vision of building an enterprise. And there are a lot of people who are doing this really successfully with jobs. And there's a lot of people that you've definitely heard of who started off uh, with a job, specifically copywriting. For some reason, like copywriting, like ad writing is the launching off point for a lot of super successful people. So I'm going to throw a couple at you. I did. This was part of my research. Did you? And I'll, I'll see you. You've probably heard of some of these. So um, Stephen Pressfield, right? The, he wrote a book called The War of Art. Probably the most famous example, at least in our world, of somebody who was a, a copywriter and then became a writer writer. Uh, and for anybody who hasn't heard he, his book, The War of Art, fantastic. And then the other one is Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit, also a great book on writing. Um, but here's some that you may not have known. So uh, F, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the guy who wrote Gatsby. He was a copywriter? He started off as a copywriter oh to gosh. make money to support his art. I mean, this is a very common thing. Max These Perkins, two examples, let me cut you off real quick. These two examples, in both cases, the very last page of the war of art, when he talks about like getting a relationship with your muse completely floored me. When I read that very last page, I had to grab my wife and like read it out loud to her. I'd be like, just listen to this. And same thing with the great Gatsby. There was a page um, where you, you find out, um, was it, was her name? Misty uh, Mandy Daisy, where you find out that Daisy is actually in love with Gatsby where they're all sitting around. And she says, you always look so cool because remember it was so hot and he was the only one in a suit that wasn't sweating. I was like, oh my God. So it's so crazy. Those two stories copywriters, because in both of those examples, I specifically remembering some of the reading, some of their work and just being floored in my tracks and just like stopping and having to take a moment. So, so totally. please continue. I just needed to say that. Totally. No. I, and I think there's a reason for that. I'll get into it in a second, but well, I'll just get into it now. I think the reason that, and there's a bunch of them, I got a couple other examples that might surprise you, but I think the reason that so many people who start in copywriting end up being successful either as writers or in business is because of the mechanics of copywriting. Not only are you um, forced to like improve your writing and understand what hold grabs and hold attention, but you also learn like what drives people to buy. And so you're in a really good position to start a business after that, because you understand that transfer of value and like what, what, what captures people's attention. Um, So a couple others, uh, Max Perkins, he, which is actually, he's the editor who discovered uh, Fitzgerald and Hemingway and a bunch of other people that those are all under like Max Perkins pen uh, early on. Mm-hmm. Hugh Hefner. Did you know he started what? off? Yeah, he was a copy. He was an ad guy. He wrote, he wrote ads and then he quit that job to start Playboy. And I don't know if anybody's seen it, but there's like a, I don't know, maybe five or seven part uh, docudrama series. I think it's on Amazon. And I might have the title wrong, but I think it's called American Playboy about the history of that magazine. And it's really good. I I never knew how influential Playboy was in the media world because, you know, I'm, I was born in the 90s. So it's like it was always just a joke like, oh, I read Playboy for the articles. Right. Yeah. That was always the joke. Yeah, yeah. But it turns <laughs> yeah, out the they joke. were like they're on the cutting edge of every media revolution that came at, at the time. Like they were one of the first ones into television. Uh, Hef was one of the first people to run. Um, oh, my God, I, I'm blanking on his name now. Malcolm X, like Malcolm X is writing. And the last published words of Martin Luther King Jr. ran in Playboy. And like until the day he died, Steve Jobs said that the best interview he ever did was Playboy because they completely reinvented the way that they sent their journalists to go do interviews. So that's a a tangent. But the idea is all these people started as ad writers. And last thing I'll say about this, uh, it wasn't just dudes. So here are a couple super famous uh, women. If you haven't heard of their name, I might not be surprised, but you've definitely uh, been influenced by their work. So have you heard of Helen Lanzone Rezor? No. Okay. So this is crazy. Um, she started off as an ad writer, I think at J Walter Thompson, which is an ad agency in New York and was basically credited as being the best copywriter of her day. She's the person who like, you know, the, the saying sex sells. Yeah. This was her work. She literally introduced an ad, uh, for soap 
And kind of the tagline was, the image was, uh, there was a woman and there was a guy kind of like hovered over her, kissing her on the cheek. And the tagline was like skin that's touchable or skin that you can touch or something like that. It was the first time anybody had introduced sex into advertising, or at least that's kind of how the story goes. This idea that like women can be sensual and products can be sensual was something that she had created massively successful she ended up becoming like a vp at, at j walter thompson and is again one of the most influential ad writers and business owners wow. of her time and then another one is uh, mary wells lawrence she started off writing ads for uh, jack tinker and partners which was they, i guess they were sort of like hired guns for several different ad agencies then uh, at some point she was denied a promotion. So she stepped out and just built her own ad firms called Wells, Rich and Green. And I'm not super into the ad world, so I don't know a lot of these names, but uh, she was the highest paid ad executive in the entire country back in 1969. And you know, the I Heart New York, like that whole sure. thing came out of her ad that agency. Her. Yeah. She also did uh, like Alka-Seltzer, the, what is it? Like plot, plot, fizz, fizz, just like <laughs> unbelievably successful and uh, like business owner started off as a copywriter. So all that is to say, you do not have to step out on your own immediately. You, you can build these empires starting with a job. The way to look at it though, and we'll, maybe we'll go through some examples of people later on who are doing a good job of building this entire ladder right now. Um, but the way to think about it is you gotta be delivering value and you're probably going to be looking at like some kind of marketing position in order to do that. Okay. So that's, that's that. Anything else you would say about this early phase of cash flow first? Um, not too much other than to reiterate that uh, it's perfectly fine to have a job. <laughs> like I really, really think that's important. I started my blog, my first blog while I was selling uh, medical supplies. And I even still credit a ton of my success to that job because calling 120 people a day and getting hung up on over and over again and just learning how to be told no and to keep going is so, so valuable to me. So um, no, I really, I just want to hear more, but I do want to stop and like put a stamp on the idea that like, if you listen to this and you have a job, please don't quit your job. <laughs> you know, like keep your cash, hustle two hours a day, on your downtime, might lose a little bit of sleep. You might have to lose your weekends and spend them at Starbucks instead of getting cocktails with your friends, but like, it'll definitely be worth it. I'm glad you mentioned something there too, uh, related to like getting cocktails with your friends. Cause here's one other thing that I think makes this easier, especially if you're going to do some kind of like overlap where uh, you're working a job that might not be related to this industry. Yeah. You're gonna try and build this inside. This is commonly said, uh, there's this concept of like, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. People say it all the time. I think it's kind of hard to internalize because I heard it for a long time before it ever really kind of impacted me. I always believed it. Right. But I never really took action on it. I'm now convinced that it is the most important part of this whole thing. So if you're going to make a play in this field, you will benefit asymmetrically yeah. from getting around people who are a couple of steps ahead of you uh, in the process. And this is something that I only really internalized when I got my job at The Hustle. Um, so there were two things that kind of played out there. First, I, like, I guess to give people the background, for anybody who doesn't know me, um, I write for a newsletter called The Hustle. We have this product called Trends. It's all about um, surfacing business ideas that you can capitalize on. And uh, and a colleague of mine, Steph Smith, we had worked together at our last company. She reached out to me out of the blue because she knew that I was trying to like break into writing and said, hey, you know, we're hiring people for this particular role. Uh, it was an analyst role. And specifically, our job is to uh, write about what like the next big thing. I was not thrilled with that idea when I first heard it, because I never thought of myself as somebody who was really good at figuring out what the next big thing was. Um, but I decided to take a swing at it anyways. And then uh, two things hooked me. So first I figured out that I was actually pretty good at it. And uh, I think there's you an important really lesson there. It, by the way. Oh, thank you. But okay. we'll, uh, we'll get into that a little bit later, like the lesson, the lesson there. 
But the second, like the more important thing, the thing that uh, really reeled me in was the community that this company had built. I took one look at it and I had never seen conversations like that anywhere. There were just, there were people who seemed so normal talking about, you know, building like five, six, seven, or sorry, six, seven, eight figure businesses, even nine figure businesses as though it was nothing. And I knew that I needed to be around those people. And so like that community was where I really hooked me in and I kind of learned a passion for the job, but the people was like the huge thing. The other aspect of that was by taking that job, it put me around people at the hustle who are all just killer at what they do. I mentioned Steph, we'll probably come back to her in a little bit because she's doing a really great job of, of, of exactly the business model we're talking about here. Um, you know, if you're on Twitter, maybe you've heard of Trung Fan. He's a colleague of mine. Uh, you know, Zach, uh, oh my God, I'm going to blank on his last name because <laughs> my Slack's not up right now. But <laughs> um, it put me around a bunch of people who are better than me at what we do. And there's a lot of value to that. So yeah. I'm glad you mentioned uh, this concept of like spending time around your friends and how you might have to sacrifice that. You may have to sacrifice it, or you may find that you like even you change who your friend circle is. And if you do, or if you spend time around people who are doing this, you're going to benefit a lot from that. So that's a lot of information related to this first segment, cash flow first. Do not sacrifice like your quality of living to go off and build a company. Uh, because you're just making everything harder for yourself. And there's two ways to do it. You can get a job or you can start freelancing. And if you're freelancing, just make sure you're thinking about something that's delivering measurable value to, the, to your clients because yeah. it's going to be a lot easier to land them. So moving on, then we move into these like final two phases. Um, what I had called trust and influence. You have a different name for it, but uh, that's kind of like the growing your audience phase, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then paid products at the end. So trust and influence. Let's dig into this real quick. The thing that I had set up front is um, there are a lot of different avenues to this. This could be podcasts or Twitter or TikTok or whatever. I think what's important to note is that the monetize, there's two things. It's important to realize what you're doing here in this phase. And we'll get, we'll get into the specifics in a second, but at the high level, here's what you're doing. You're growing an audience. And this is from a business perspective, yeah. from a personal perspective, what you're doing is you're, you are sh like showing your value and you're trying to get people to trust you. And that's really, really important. It's important not to let the business side outshine the trust side, right? Because the trust is the most important thing, but from a business perspective, you're doing two things. And that is you're growing an audience that you can sell ads against, Right. And you're building distribution for your paid products. So I think the trust thing gets talked about quite a lot. Um, I don't really have much more to say about that. We can do another episode on it because it, it is quite common to talk about. But if we talk about this strictly from a business perspective, those two things that I just said, growing an audience to, to sell ads against and distribution for paid products, we're going to discuss how these play out. And specifically, like with things like newsletters, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, blogs, uh, LinkedIn audience, all those things. The, the method of monetizing ads inside of those is pretty much the same, right? Like you have paid ads, sponsorship deals, or you have like affiliates. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I mean when I say we, like, if you don't understand the model, you can pick the tools because it's all kind of the same. So that's what you're doing. Let's get into specifics though. How do you think about this realm? Like, what is the goal for you? And, and I'll dig in and just say, if you were starting from scratch, and you kind of gotten to this point, you've got your cash flow in place. Now it's time to grow your audience. What's the first thing you're going to focus on? I'm going to start a blog. It's just, oh. I'm, I'm old school and I have seen ups and downs with basically every social media platform. Um, I've seen very, very few like violent ups and downs from search engines. Um, and yeah, there's, there's risks to doing that as well. But in my view, the, I look at these things in terms of probabilities, right? It's not necessarily like this is the best thing to do. It's a probability for success. And the way to maximize your probability for success is to build a writing habit of like a long form-ish written article, properly formatted, 
published once a week, let's call it, on a domain and a hosting platform that you own and you convert that web traffic into an email list. And then the thing is, if you wanna use social media, the purpose of social media is to direct all of those traffic to your blog. And so if you have a great following on social media, that's great, you know, but you, you, the, the value of a social media following isn't the following on social media. The value of it is the redirection of attention to your blog and subsequently your email list. And like, I don't know, like if you do that, you cannot fail. Like it might take longer for some people and others. Maybe you started a blog in an industry that just has too much competition or maybe like there's just not enough products in it, like whatever the case may be. But that scheme just does not fail over and over again on repeat, like forever. I, that's really well put. Um, there's a couple of things I want to unpack there. First of all, interesting that you choose a blog. I actually, I think you're right. I think you're right about the blog. And this is not where I had gone with my notes, but it is something that I've seen uh, play out a couple of times. So one thing that is definitely true, you need some kind of property that you own. Right. Yeah. And this isn't something that I've paid as much attention to. Uh, in fact, we were just talking before we recorded uh, or a couple of days ago about my own personal site. It's it's like it's just kind of been sitting there for the last couple of years. Right. So I've never been great with this, but I think you're right. You need a place to convert people from being like interested to some kind of owned audience by yeah. an email list. And that is crucial. So I do think a blog of some kind is the first step. And actually, um, you know, Sam, the guy who started our company, Sam Parr has been pretty bullish on blogs the last year or so again. And I think, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but the impression that I've gotten is, is something along the lines of like, you know, media is kind of like cyclical and uh, some of the, like the newer, fancier technologies have been popular recently. Um, so there's like an opportunity for builders to start building in blogs again. Like blogs mm -hmm. are just, they're not as uh, saturated as they were. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, that's always what happens. Like there's something new comes out, something else becomes less popular. And then it's, it's a cycle. People uh, spend their time and money on the thing that's less popular because it's less competitive the and they can it. Yeah, exactly. In fact, fun fact, that's actually happening in direct mail right now. So like nobody uses, everybody's advertising online. We just did a report recently on how like direct mail is wow. actually seeing this interesting surge. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I think you're right about the blog. And I've seen other people uh, back up that play. Um, you mentioned that there are a few different, like, actually, I can't remember the words you used, but you made me think of this, this concept of how there's like three different levers at play when you're building an audience in one of these properties. And they are the size of your audience, how much money they have to spend, and then how mm -hmm. engaged they are with you. And you only ever really need two of those three. So if you have a big audience with a little bit of money to spend, but they're like really engaged and they'll follow you, uh, you can make a very good business off of that. Similarly, if you have an uh, incredibly small audience with a lot of money to money. spend, yeah, and they trust you, you don't need a lot of people. Like I have a friend uh, in the Twitter world who's got a extremely niche newsletter um it is it's for people who own photo booth businesses there's like a thousand people on it and that and he monetizes that at like a six figure per year what yeah right because these he's basically got everybody in the industry right who owns a, a photo booth business on this newsletter list and they buy stuff so um those are the three levers, the size of the audience, how much money they're willing to spend and how engaged they are with you. And, and you only ever really need two out of those three. But in, in this phase, it's important to keep those both in mind because if you're gonna be positioning ads against an audience, you need to know things like, well, how big are they? How engaged are they? How much money are they willing to spend? It's going to affect whether or not you can uh, sell ads well and whether those ads will perform. Uh, and then similarly, we talked about distribution, how this like this phase is really about building distribution for your future paid products. Um, as Tim mentioned, in order to 
distribute a paid product to somebody, you, you need to like own their contact information. So you can't really be relying on just your Twitter feed. You need to be converting them to like email or something like that. And uh, if you keep those three levers in mind, it's going to help you to determine what kind of paid products you can build down the line. So like, I'm not going to, if my audience doesn't really have a ton of disposable income, I'm not going to create a $5,000 course, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. What would be your strategy? If you had to start, what would you do? So interesting question. I am. So I feel like I'm kind of in this phase, right? Like I've got the cash flow thing. I, I, I'm happy at my job. I love what I'm doing. Um, and a big focus for me would be is currently growing this like level of trust and influence. And so I should fix up my blog first. And I'm going to probably do that and, and keep it very simple, like just some kind of, hey, this is who I am. Sign up here if you want to hear stuff yeah. from me. Uh, but for me, in terms of like sharing information and getting the word out there, there's two formats that I really enjoy. Uh, Twitter is one that's, and it's because it's pretty short form. And also, I think the bar there is pretty low. Like there are a few people who write incredible Twitter threads. Yeah. The vast majority of people don't. And so that's a very fun spot to compete in because I think you you get noticed really fast there if you're putting out quality work. Um, and then audio. I love this. So this is another like format for me. But if it were me just starting over from scratch, now that I've heard you talk through it and I know I know what I really should do. I would get that blog ready to capture information, but I would be doubling down on Twitter and like whatever it is that I'm supposed to be an expert at, I'd be writing super high quality threads there uh, and a resource for people to check out if they're interested in this. There's a guy named Alex Garcia. He used to run uh, social media at the hustle. And now he, uh, he basically he's doing this. He's building kind of his own media empire. So he, he, when he was here, he grew his personal Twitter following from like 4,000 to 40,000 plus in less than two months. And he did it by sharing one really high quality thread per day over wow. the course of, uh, I think it was 50 days. And so his, uh, let me just grab his Twitter handle real fast for people. It's uh, his Twitter handle is Alex Garcia underscore ATX cool guy does a lot of like marketing based stuff you can check out and i saw recently he's actually going to create a course related to twitter growth so if twitter is on your like list of things to grow if that's part of your path he's definitely one person who knows what he's doing on there it's really cool and is able to actually teach those lessons to other people so i learned a lot of what i know from him anyways long story long i would do twitter threads in order to grow that influence I think that another, uh, you, you mentioned audio and I have a lot of thoughts about audio as well, because people think that there's so many podcasts out there right now, but there's actually not. Um, there's only about 2 million podcasts and a very, very small amount of them get any kind of like significant downloads. And the vast majority of podcasts start and then stop. I think it's before like 40 episodes or something. Um, the thing that is cool about podcasts, and there's some really cool data about this, is somehow the relationship that we form with each other by listening to their voice, like doubles down on the trust because we feel like we get to know them a little bit. You know, like I feel like, uh, what's a podcast I listen to? There's an MMA podcast, a guy named Brendan Shop, because I like martial arts. I've, I've, I've been into martial arts my whole life. And if I were to see Brendan Schaub on the street, like I generally feel like I should just go up to him and be like, oh, hey, man, like I've been listening to you a long time. Like I heard that you were doing this and you were doing that because like, I, I got to know them through their voice. And uh, a guy named Pat Flynn from Smart Passive Income, he's got a lot of stuff about this, which I think is really cool. Um, just because there's so many more blogs than there are podcasts. And the consistency of staying with the podcast, like you mentioned compounding earlier, the compounding effect for staying with the podcast is very, very, very high just because it's a little bit harder, you know, like the production value um, and coming up with things to say on the spot. And I think there's like not quite that veil to hide behind in the same way that there is with Twitter and with, with writing blogs. Um, I, I think those things make it difficult for people to stay really consistent with podcasts over a long period of time. The very few that do, see really, really, really good results from it. So, um, so yeah, I guess after listening to you, 
Twitter threads is cool. Um, I, I think if you're going to do social media, doubling down on Twitter is the best way to do it, which is basically what I do. But if I personally had to choose a number two, I would do a podcast. Um, I just think that the, the long-term value of it is so much greater than um, everything other than an email list. Do you ever worry about your face or voice being used in like deep fakes? Cause there's so much audio of you out there. <laughs> I mean, the way I think about it is kind of like people stealing my writing. You know, it's like, if somebody's actually deep faking me, then that's probably the least of my problems. You know what I mean? Like if I made it to the point where I'm being deep faked, <laughs> then it's probably just not that big a deal in general. That's interesting. Yeah, I uh, that does cross my mind. Um, but I, I I like what you're saying about the value of a podcast. And it's interesting that you bring this up now. Um, I was just listening to the My First Million podcast the other day, which, you know, it's it's uh, one that Sam runs and like there's a lot of people here that are involved in it. So so on my on my repeat list and Sean was saying something similar. He said, yeah, it's like a, a podcast, like the hardest thing he's ever had to grow. Or I think, I think maybe Sam said like a podcast is the hardest thing I've ever had to grow, but um, the stickiness is like just way higher. Yeah. So it's like so much harder for whatever reason to convince people to download and try your podcast. Um, but once they do, and like, to your point, once they feel like they get to know you, they stick around like a lot longer yeah, it's for anybody who's interested in um some preliminary data on this especially related to like the 30 or 40 episode mark that you mentioned it's interesting that you mentioned that because steph just said the other day uh, she's growing a podcast and it's called the shit you don't learn in school podcast and they're i think just over episode 50 and like what they saw was for the first 30 episodes they got about 200 downloads per uh per episode by episode 30 they were getting like 200 ish by episode 40, they broke a thousand downloads per episode. And then by episode 50, they just broke 10,000 downloads for the month and they had their first wow. thousand download day. Wow. So for anybody who's thinking about getting into this, you know, take what Tim is saying seriously. Like if you can break that 40 episode barrier and really keep the consistency, you're going to start to outpace everybody else in this game. This is great, man. I feel like I feel like anybody listening to this is getting a really good understanding of where to start. And so what, where does that leave us? Now we're talking about, we've developed cash flow, So we either kept our job or we started maybe a freelance business or we have some way to sell our time to start generating some money in, in our pockets. 10 grand a month is, is what we said. We've developed our trust and influence. So if it were up to me, you'd start a blog, leverage that blog to gain an email list, potentially create a, a good Twitter following. Um, Twitter subscribers do subscribe to emails, which is the other thing that's really cool about it, or a podcast. I, I feel good like recommending these three um, mediums of media. And so now what? Now I, now I guess we're at the stage that I thought we were going to be starting at, which is like, which of these monetization methods makes the most sense? Um, I... I, I'm going to stop here because I just have so many pros and cons to both of them because I've, I've experimented so much in all of these different ways to make money online. Um, and I know that you're like the data research nerd. So I, I feel like you probably have some kind of insight on like, this is the best place to go. Um, yeah. So let me, <laughs> let me, <laughs> let me start again with uh, principles. Yeah, I think if you understand the principles, you can choose your own path. Yeah. yeah so I, good line. I gotta write that down. I think as we mentioned, you can monetize inside of that trust and influence phase, right? By basically you're serving ads. Yeah. The difficulty with ads though is that they're sort of a flash in the pan, right? So if you're selling ads or doing sponsorships, if you sell $100,000 worth of ads this year, next year, you have to go and do that all over again, more if you wanna grow. And that's where this, where I think this third phase really comes in handy is creating repeatable, scalable income. Yep. Um, that's really what the target is here. And so again, there's going to be a lot of different paths, whether it's a paid community or a paid newsletter or um, something like a course. 
but the end goal is recurring revenue uh, that can scale without scaling your costs, right? So that's what you're really trying to do here. Now, as for, I thought a little bit, I thought about the, I think you laid out three examples there. So courses, paid newsletters, paid communities. I'll say two things about these. First, there's a lot of overlap here, right? Because very often you'll get a course that has a community with it or yep. you know, a paid newsletter that offers yeah, courses. Yeah, that has like a like login that. wall and like is kind of a membership. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so um, for that reason, I think it's kind of helpful to think about these as falling into uh, two different buckets. And this is kind of straight out of the media world. So in the media world, what you have are called front-end products and back-end products. They're both paid, but the big difference is uh, how expensive they are and how specific they are. And so a uh, front-end product will typically be somewhere between like five and 10 bucks a month. That's right within the range of what you would consider to be like uh, an impulse buy. So 50 mm -hmm. to hundred bucks, somebody's not going to think super hard about buying that and uh, 50 to hundred bucks a year, right? So that's, that's a front end. And it's typically a little bit more broad. A back end would start anywhere from like five to $700 per year and go all the way up. I mean, you can have things that are five, 10, $15,000 a year, depending on what it is you're selling. And so if you think about your options as falling into those two buckets, you can see how each of these could fall into, you could have a, you could have an inexpensive class, you could have a super expensive class, you could have an inexpensive newsletter or a super expensive newsletter. The difference is going to be how much value you're delivering in order to make sure people feel like they're getting what they're paying for, right? So trends, which is the newsletter that I write for, would be considered, it's not really priced like one, but it, it would be considered like a front end product, right? Sure. It's a couple hundred bucks. Um, and you know, like our job is to give you business ideas. And, well, and even one step before that, that would mean that the hustle is basically like the distribution mechanism. So even though you're leveraging it for ads, still what you're doing is you're building the distribution because without the hustle, you couldn't sell trends. So you have a distribution mechanism, a front end product, which in your case is trends. Yep. And then potentially you have back end products. And like we experimented with some different ideas. This has changed a little bit because we got acquired by a large publicly traded company. And so the, the need for like a back end product specifically related to trends changed. Um, but yes, if, it, if we were still just a media company, uh, then you would build something on the back end of trends that you would sell trends members that would take the, the value up to the next level. So a great example to look at for this is James Altucher. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he does. I think two front end newsletters that are like, you know, one to 200 bucks a year. But then he's got three or more back end newsletters that are very specific, um, different like trading algorithms that he writes about. And I think they're $5,000 or more a year. And the logic there for anybody who buys them is, well, one good trade will get me far more than the $5,000 I spend on this. Yeah. That's the logic that you're playing with when you're playing with these paid products. How much value is somebody going to get out of them? Uh, and you just kind of need to make sure that that um, is set up for, to make to make it like a, a no brainer. But it, it can be any of these forms as long as it works for the audience that you've built. And the last thing that I'll say related to this is it's easy to mess this up if you are not in touch with the audience that sure. you've grown. And we talked about this, I think, in our last episode where we talked about, you know, really like famous people with large Instagram followings who aren't selling books. Right. Like Justin Timberlake's book has sold, I think I forget the number. It's less than a hundred thousand dollars worth of the book though, or less than a hundred thousand copies. It's, it's a small number given the enormous community they've built. And the reason is because the product is probably out of sync with the audience, right? He could sell something else, but it's probably just not going to be a book. And so you need to be in touch with that audience. You know, how big are they? How engaged are they? How much money are they willing to spend? What do they want from you? in order to decide which of these product paths to go down. Um, which one would you pick? If you were starting from scratch, you got your Twitter distribution and or your, uh, your blog and your social media, your podcast. Now it's time to monetize on the back end. You're looking for that like scalable, repeatable revenue. What are you, what are you going for? <laughs> okay. This is why I like having these conversations with you so much because you have a really, really keen ability to dive deeper into like the method as opposed to 
the tool, right? Um, because when I started this conversation, I was doing my research. I was thinking like, okay, I got a couple options here. But really like the option, or as I called it, the scheme earlier is totally irrelevant because any of those can be replaced with the other. What's important is that you follow like this entire method. So listening to you, like I'm already doing this. And even in the examples, there's differences between, you know, the scheme, but the method is the same. So let's take copy blogger. Copy blogger is a blog that turns into an email list. We sell affiliate deals. Um, I promote the digital commerce agency through the email list. It monetizes within its own, but for the most part, it's a distribution channel. The distribution channel sells our front end product, which is the copy blogger Academy. Um, like you said, it's not priced like one, but it really is a front end membership. It's 49 bucks a month. Um, and great. Our back end product, we are actually launching um, at, in, on April 1st, which is a certification program. And it is an in-depth course um, and membership. And like, we're attaching a job board to it as well, because we figure like, if you get certified, you get certified because you want to get more work. You know, like you don't actually want the certification, you want more business. And so along with the certification, there's gonna be a job board. Um, and so, you know, that's expensive. We haven't quite priced it yet, but I think it's going to be 25, 3000 bucks. Right. Um, so like I'm following this same exact scheme. And even if I think about Stadzi, so Stadzi is an agency, but the method is exactly the same. We have an email list. A ton of our clients come through the emails. I can't tell you how many leads I get. It was like, Hey man, I've been reading your emails, you know? So like the distribution channel. And then in a way, the services that we provide is the front end product. Like I know we're talking about semantics here, right? But it's basically like the entry point to doing business with us. But on the back end, we're actually building a piece of software that is uh, very, very expensive, but very, very useful because in, 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 in healthcare, one of the problems with running a healthcare business is that you don't actually get paid in cash. You get paid in insurance claims, right? And there's like a ton of paperwork and insurance companies do everything they can not to pay you. Um, so we're like developing a pretty expensive product to help with this, but it's expensive, but the value is totally there because you fix some of these things. All of a sudden you're making another like 40 grand a month in revenue. Right? So what did I give to you? I gave to you like a media company that sells digital products. And I gave to you like a service business that, that sells its time in exchange for money. But both of those things followed this same exact method, which is distribution front end back end. I'm way too hype right now. This is like, this is too cool. I love it. <laughs> Good. I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that this, that this uh, feels like it resonates as a kind of like a universal model. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned this because I was just talking to my dad about this uh, this morning, not this particular model, but I was, we were talking about why, why is it that like every company seems to end up becoming a finance company? Like there's this, it seems like there's this gravitational pull in business, the things start like way out here on the margins, and then they trickle down towards more and more viable business uh, models until like the beating heart of business is finance, right? Yeah. Like, and then everything, everything just becomes a bank at some point. I don't know if you know this. I was just reading an article the other day. Did you know that airlines don't make any money on passengers anymore? Nope. Airlines, yeah, they they like they lose like eighteen cents for every passenger that they fly, but through their points and rewards programs and stuff like that, that's where all their profit comes from. And a huge part of their like valuation as a company. So airlines have effectively become banks that happen to fly people across the country. Crazy. Yeah. So anyways, I think if you, if you or anybody else looks at uh, different companies or creators in this space now that they kind of have this model framework that we've talked about here you probably see it more and more it's one of those things it's like once you see it you can't unsee it sure um and we can talk about a couple other examples of like smaller creators i mean you have tons of examples in your research doc here of like so pop pop's a great example of somebody who's killing it at this right he's and he's even gone beyond what we've talked about to include things like job boards which you mentioned mm -hmm. which is another great way of monetizing once you have some kind of active audience. Um, Substack as a company, it, it, 
facilitates this, right? You can have free newsletters, you can have paid newsletters, and there's a lot of people building on Substack. Um, Seed table, I've never heard of, but I'd be curious to know. It sounds like they're, do you think they're probably using something similar? Yeah, I would actually really like Gans. Um, he's a buddy of mine. He basically built the hustle, but for Europe. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's a weekly newsletter just all about um, new business, tech, and investment trends, but in Europe. <laughs> like, so oh, that's awesome. London is more that. or less like the, uh, the Silicon Valley of Europe. So he's, he's really fun to read. But yeah, that's he's all- got the same thing. He's got a front end product and then he's got like a consulting firm on the back end of it for high end deals. That's awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to check his out. Um, I have maybe two others that I think these are people that I think people should check out if they want an example of like how one person does this. Cause actually it's worth, this is worth calling out too. Um, I think some people have s- like I've benefited asymmetrically from a media company that involves a lot of people. Like there's a lot of people at the hustle. I'm yeah. I'm just one person in a large machine that is making this work. Um, but there are some people who are doing versions of this on their own. So like I've mentioned Steph before. Uh, she, she's interesting because for cash flow, she's like kind of always had a job. So she was uh, like a team leader at our last company. She's I think a director of marketing at HubSpot or VP, I'm not sure what her precise title is, but basically she's got the job for the cash flow, um, building her audience on Twitter and via a podcast and her blog, all of which are like really successful. And then she's got two um, products. They'd probably be considered front-end products at this point since they're somewhere in like the hundreds of dollars range, I think like yeah. 50 to hundred bucks. Um, and they're kind of like courses. So and she's been open about this. Those courses have generated more than six figures in their first 12 months of existence. So uh, she's a really interesting example. Somebody people should definitely check out. Uh, she's Steph Smith IO, I think. On she Twitter. did a, a masterclass for me in the Copy Blogger Academy. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah. yeah she was odd. Uh, that that must have been awesome because she's also just a very interesting thinker, great person to have on. Yeah. And- I always, every time I listen to her, I always think, like, what is your IQ? Maybe like 140 or something. Like this, you know? Yeah, it's definitely got to be high. <laughs> um, have you ever heard of Justin Welsh? No. He's kind of making the rounds on Twitter too. So I've, I haven't met him yet, but uh, he's good at tweeting. Let me, I'll just grab his Twitter handle for anybody who's listening. So uh, let's see. It's at Justin Sass, S-A-A-S. He, he does nice. like Sass consulting. Um, he's a super interesting guy though. So here, listen to this. He is he ex like tech executive, right? So big paycheck there. I guess his story was that he burned out at some point a couple of years ago. So him and his wife sold their place in SF and they moved, I think to, I think to your neck of the woods, I think they're in Nashville. Um, and he's grown a series of one man businesses to about uh, $1.3 million in revenue over the last couple of years. So here's how he did it. First, uh, advising. He advises SaaS founders. Uh, specifically, the model he uses, it's a retainer model, $4,000 a month, 90-day retainer. So if anybody's thinking about getting into something similar, that's one that he's made work. Um, then he, in order to get that going, he started writing on LinkedIn. And people started writing on LinkedIn about his experience leading sales teams at other companies, right? So something that he already knew People started reaching out to him and asking him to consult, literally, like this is exactly the model that we're talking about. Um, Continue to uh, grow his LinkedIn audience. By the way, we talked about monetizing against that influence. Mm -hmm. That LinkedIn audience has driven, I believe he wrote more than $1.1 million in business. And he actually laid out his um, revenue. And I I think this is total revenue of the last three years, or it might be 2021 revenue. It's one of those two things. So consulting so far has driven $880,000, right? Through consulting. He's got a course on uh, actually two courses. Um, So those are his like front end products. They've done $341,000. And then he's got a paid community and it's done $81,000 in business. So started as an executive, went on, Cash flow. The freelance. Yep. Ca- yeah. yeah. Cash flow. Then started growing his influence on LinkedIn. 
mm-hmm. and then develop these courses and paid communities as kind of the, the, the recurring uh, revenue. So uh, those are a couple of people to check out. And then one other person actually that I think does a really cool job of this. I'm not a freelance writer, so I don't, I don't know too much about it, but there's somebody named Alice LeMay. Have you heard of her? No, I've never heard of her. She's on Twitter too. It's just Alice and then L sorry, L E M E E. And she's a freelance writer and she writes about the business of freelance writing. And she's pretty cool. I follow her stuff. Nice. So those are a couple other people that I think are kind of on the early ish side. They're like one to two steps ahead of anybody who is just thinking of getting into this. And they're probably just based on what I know, 18 months to three years into the product, the project. And I guess that's probably a good place to say this, this is last a great place thing. to start. I feel like this episode was, there's so much information that we talked about, but um, like each one of these sections requires so much nuance and context, you know? So with this episode, uh, we, I know that you're going to do it because you love threads, but I'll also create an outline and probably publish it on the blog, which is rainmaker.fm. Um, we need to write this one out as well because it's, every single one of these stages has so many different nuance because there's not like one path to success, right? But there is a formula. And so let's make sure we put together that formula in written form so that people can like come back and, and, uh, and, and reference it when they're building their own little personal enterprise for themselves. For sure. Yeah. And, and let us know what, what everybody thinks. I mean, I'm sure there's Hopefully there's a, a bunch of follow-up questions. And if you want us to dig in on anything in particular, we're happy to do an episode yeah. uh, on, on any of those things, how you get your first client. I mean, I think that'd be a fun one. Like how did, like sure. not, not just theoretically, how do you do it? But like, how did you do it? Cause I how do you do it totally. Yeah, We should do yeah. that. Let's do that next because I have so, I like, I just have so much fucking sales experience. And so we can really dig into that one. All right, cool. We'll do that next week. So everybody, if you want to hear about specifically the nitty gritty, regret and like the good the bad the ugly of how we got our first clients uh, just come back next week and we'll we'll talk about it and then let us know what you think hi right, everyone thank you so much for listening to this episode of the copy blogger podcast as always give us a comment on itunes give us a subscribe on spotify on itunes we publish we record every friday we publish every monday and of course uh you can sign up for the email list at copyblogger.com in which you can get access every friday to the recent episode So we really appreciate you guys. All right, Ethan, talk to you next week. Later, man. Yeah.